Psalm 139.14 says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, created from nothing. Do you despise yourself, or do you know you are made for His purpose? In this lesson, K. Arthur looks at Elohim, the Creator. Do you know what my prayer for you is? I do this study, Lord, I want to know you on the names of God. My prayer is that over the next weeks, that God would make His glory to pass before you. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33. Moses was very, very troubled. And he was troubled because the children of Israel had sinned greatly against God. And God had just had it with the children of Israel. He wanted to walk away from them. He wanted to, to just take Moses and, 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 and make another nation out of Moses. And yet, you see, no, Moses loved his God, and Moses desired God's glory more than his. And so Moses went to the tent, a tent of meeting. It's my prayer for you that you will develop a tent of meeting, a tent of meeting where you will meet with your God and where his glory will pass by you as you get to know him by name. Exodus chapter 33, verse 7. It says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And it came about that everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about that whenever Moses went out to the tent, that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. And it came about that whenever Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. Now, this pillar of cloud is called the Shekinah glory. It's the glory of God. It, it, it symbolized the very presence of God. It was this pillar of cloud that became a pillar of fire that led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt when Pharaoh was pursuing them. It was this pillar of fire that, that, that stood between Pharaoh and his army and the children of Israel and, and kept uh, their distance. It was this pillar of, of fire that was also in the daytime a pillar of cloud that eventually would, would camp over, over the Holy of Holies. And uh, when Moses would build the tabernacle, and they would know that the presence of God was there. So this pillar of God represented God in all of His glory, and that's why we call it the Shekinah glory. And so this is what would happen. Moses would want to be with God. Moses would need to be with God. Moses had a tent of meeting. You need a tent of meeting. You need a place to go every day. You need a time to get alone. You need a time to be quiet with your God. You need a time to, to just bask in who He is and to get to know who He is and to let His glory pass by you so that you can handle every situation of life. And this is is what Moses says in verse 13. He says, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy sight, let me know thy ways, that I may know thee, so that I might find favor in thy sight. Consider too that this nation is thy people. What does Moses want to know? Moses wants to know God's ways. The whole purpose of studying, Lord, I want to know you. The whole purpose of getting to know the names of God is so that you might know the ways of God, so that you might know him. If you know his ways, you know him, and you find favor in his sight. Verse 14, and God said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And then he, Moses, said to him, if thy presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. God, I don't want to go without you. God, I don't want to face anything without you. God, I don't want to make a step, a move without you. If your presence is God not going to go with me, then I don't want to go. 
And that's the whole purpose of the tent of meeting, is so that you and I might meet with God, so that we might know our God and know His ways. And then when we walk out of that tent of meeting, that quiet time alone with God, we know that God is going with us. But not only do we know that God is going with us, but we know what God is like that is going with us. Verse 16, he says, For how then can it be known that I have found favor in thy sight, I and thy people? Is it not by thy going with us, so that we, I and thy people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of this earth? O oh God, this is what is going to distinguish me from all the other people on the face of this earth, and that is that I know you, I know your ways, and you're going with me. And I want to tell you something. That's what distinguishes you, and that's what distinguishes me. God does not exempt you and me from the situations and the circumstances of life that are difficult, that are hard. We don't live lives or that, that have different environments, in a sense, than the rest of the world. But we can live a life that is different in the midst of that environment that the rest of the world lives in. And we do that because we know God. Look at Exodus 33, verse 18. Then Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And that's what I want God to do in our study on the names of God. I want God to show us his glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about that while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with all my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And so God passes before Moses, and he shows him his glory. Now, that's what he's going to do as we study the names of God. You're going to go to a tent of meeting, I pray. And as you go to that tent of meeting and as you pray over these lessons, as you ask God to, to take that word and to translate it into understanding and into flesh and blood, then God is going to hide you in the cleft of the rock and he's going to cause all of his glory to pass before you as he beholds, as you behold who he really is. One of the names of God is the name Elohim. And you want to write that down. The first time that you ever meet God, the first time that the word of God, the word God is ever used in the scriptures, it is the uh, Hebrew word Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. And you find this in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as his glory passes by us today, I want us to see him as creator. And I want us to see what it means to you and what it means to me that he is our creator so that as we walk out and we face the issues of life, the circumstances of life, we will understand what it means to live and the fact that he is Elohim. Now, Elohim comes from two words. The word El, E-L, is the word for God. It's another word that's translated God. And it means strong or mighty. E-L means strong or mighty mighty. The I am ending, the I am ending is a plural ending. It is a plural ending. Now, when you see that plural ending, you'll see that sometimes the word Elohim has a singular verb with it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, or the Lord our God is one. And you will see many times with Elohim a singular verb. And yet the word has a plural ending. 
what is God trying to show us in this? Well, some people believe nothing. Other people believe a lot. I believe that he's trying to show us that when he speaks of his being, that it is not just God the Father that he's speaking of as creator, but it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So let me show this to you. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, there's the Spirit of God, was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, this light was not the sun. This light was not the moon. This light was not the stars because they had not yet been created. It's simply God spoke and all of a sudden there was light. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we have a parallel to uh, Genesis. And uh, because it starts off virtually the same way. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the what? The Word. Genesis 1 opens up, in the beginning was God. And this says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, can you see the parallel in Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, what? God created. And he said, let there be what? Light. And then the light came and took away the darkness. In, Genesis, in John 1, you see, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? God. And He was the same in the beginning with God. And in the Word was what? Life and light, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now drop down to John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, in the beginning was the what? Word. And the Word was what? God. And John 1.14 interprets who the Word was. The Word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His what? His glory. What passed before Moses when God hid him in the cleft of the rock? The glory of the Lord. Now, who is the glory of the Lord? What is the glory of the Lord? Well, the glory of the Lord is, is I believe, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was part of the glory of the Lord. We beheld His glory, John 1, 14, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. When Jesus Christ came to earth, he came to earth to reveal God to us, to reveal His name to us. I want you to go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I ever had with thee before the world was. Now listen. I have manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine there were, they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. When you look at God the Father, and we'll draw a triangle to represent him, you will see that it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is what comprises Elohim. It is three in one. He is, in essence, the same. Jesus is, in essence, the same as the Father. The Holy Spirit is, in essence, 
the same as the Father. In other words, they all have the same attributes. They are manifested in different ways, but they all have the same attributes. So as we look at the first name of God, Elohim, we find that name involved in creation. We find that name involved in creation. And as you look at it in creation, this is what you need to remember for your life. You need to remember that God is your creator. You exist because of God. You are a unique and special creation of God. And I want to tell you something. If you ever get hold of that, it will take care of every problem with lousy self-image. It will take care of every problem of a past that you hate and you wish that you had never been involved in because of who your father was or who your mother was or what happened to you in your childhood. Now this combined with El Elyon will literally set you free. And as you look at Elohim, the one thought that I want God to plant into your mind is this, that God created not only the heavens and the earth, but God individually, specifically created you. And if you'll grab that name, and if you'll let the glory of that pass before you, if you'll hide in all that that is, God can use it in a tremendous way in your life. I want to take you to Colossians. I want to take you to several verses just to show you the involvement. Now, I've taken you into the Trinity in the book. As you study, Lord, I want to know you, you're going to see that in, in the book, or you should already have studied it. But I want to just pick up a couple verses and show them uh, show you what they can mean to you personally. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 16, it says this, For in Him, and He's speaking of Christ, all things were created. Now remember, Christ is what? God. He is one with the Father. All things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. Now listen, and what? For him. All right, now what is he saying? Well, if we were going to do a little drawing, we would have God up here and we would have planet earth down here. In between us, in the heavens, there is a whole angelic host. There are good angels and there are bad angels. No halo on that one, okay? There is a devil, and we'll just put a pitchfork and, and nasty look on his face. All right, there's a devil. So all of these things, all of these things have been created by God, and they have been created what? for God. Now listen, when God created the angels, he made them all good. When God created Satan, he did not create him as Satan or as the devil. He created him as his highest archangel, as the highest, full of beauty and all, splendor and all of that. But he became the devil because he wanted to exalt his throne above God. He wanted to be like the Most High, and therefore God in his justice had to kick him out of heaven. And when he did, he took, according to Revelation 12, a third of the angels with him, and that's how we get this uh, demonic angelic host, this demonic angelic host. But God is the creator of all of this. Now, God is not only the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth, but God is the creator of you. All things, all things were created by him. Now listen, all things were created what? For him. And therefore, even Satan and all of his bad angels are going to be used by God to accomplish the will of God. God has it all in control. We're going to see that later on. Now I want you to go to Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, this is what we see. 
and they're singing praises to God before His throne. And they say in verse 11, Worthy art thou, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou didst create all things, and because of thy will they existed and were what? Created. Now, some of you have been told, I wish you had never been born. I just want you to know that we never planned on having you. Well, they may never have planned on having you. I mean, you may have been a big surprise to mother and father, or you may have been a big surprise to the woman who was your earthly mother, and you don't know who your earthly father is. My husband lived never really knowing who his real father was until just several years ago. My husband was an illegitimate child. He was raised by his grandmother. And just recently, his mother took him aside and said, I want you to know who your father is. Now, his father had just died. Now, Jack knew that it was one of two men in town that was his father. Normally, he would have been in this day and age, what? Aborted. But listen, you cannot tell me that Jack is any accident. Jack is God's design. Jack was born from his mother, but it was God's design that mom and pop would raise Jack and make him into the man of God he is. Now, if Jack didn't understand this, Jack could be very bitter at God, very angry at God, and very unused by God. But because God, Jack sees this and knows his God, he has accepted it, and God has used it, and God has blessed him as a result of it and touched other people's lives through it and given him hope. You exist, listen, you exist because of God. If you exist because of God, precious one, then you have worth. You have value. Someone may come along and say, you're no good. You're a slut. You don't, uh, you don't uh, uh, have any worth. You don't have any value. I wish you'd never been born. But listen, God says, lies, lies, lies. I am Elohim. And as Elohim, I am the creator. You exist because of me and you exist for me. Now, let me show you. Go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Oh, how you need to know this psalm. Oh, how you need to believe it. Oh, how I pray that God will let His glory pass before you and that He will hide you in the cleft of all that He is to you as you listen to this psalm. In Psalm 139, he says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down, and thou dost know when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought afar off. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down. Now listen, and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast, now listen, enclosed me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Do you realize what he's saying? Do you realize, remember that girl that I told you about who had been molested by her father? who shut her mouth and who did not talk for a long, long time, I began to, we began to teach that girl about God. We began to teach that girl about the character of God. We began to teach that girl about God as her creator. And this is one of the things that we showed her, that from the time that she came into this world up until this time that God had his hand on her. God had his hand on her. But listen, not just from the crib, but from the womb God had his hand on her. When God, when that sperm met that egg that made this precious little gal exactly what she is. Thou hast compassed me, what? Behind and what? 
before. Thou art acquainted with all my ways. Now let me go down. Verse 13, he says, For thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. As we go along in our study, as we look at the names of God, you're going to see who formed man's tongue, who made the deaf, who made the blind. What does the scripture say in Exodus chapter 4? What does it say in John 9, 1 and 2? Have not I, the Lord, done all these things? I'm the creator. I made you. I made you and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says in verse 14, I will give thanks to thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are thy thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. You're created by God. He is Elohim. Not only as Hebrews 1 says, did he speak and bring the world into existence, but he is the very one that brought the sperm and the egg together, brought the father and the mother, whoever it is, and put you together in your mother's womb, who fearfully and wonderfully made you, and he made you for his glory. In Romans 11, it says, From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the what? The glory forever and ever and ever. Some of you are fighting with your past. You live in depression because of who your parents were or who your parents weren't. You live in, 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 in uh, 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 feeling totally rejected, feeling totally worthless, feeling like you uh, have no purpose in life. And if you feel that way, you are believing a lie. You are believing a lie because God is what? Elohim. He is your what? Creator. He created you for His glory. He created you for his pleasure. So whatever you are like, whatever your personality, whatever your temperament, whatever uh, 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 genetically you are, God created you. He has a purpose for your life. And that purpose is to bring him glory. And when that purpose down here on earth is fulfilled, he knows the number of your days because he is not only the giver of life, but he is the taker of life. And when he takes you home, then that means that your purpose is fulfilled. And then there's no more sorrow and no more tears and no more death because the former things have passed away. The former things have passed away. And now you're whole, completely whole, made into the image of Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul says, You have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when he who had set me apart even from my mother's womb. What's he saying? He's saying this, that even from his mother's womb, God had set Paul apart. Elohim, who created Paul, who created Paul for his pleasure, 
who created Paul for his will, set Paul apart from his mother's womb. Yet Paul did not come to know Jesus Christ until much later in life. Between the time of Paul's birth and the time of Paul's rebirth, Paul had been guilty of putting Christians to death. He had consented to the death of Stephen. He said, I am the chief of sinners. It is a uh, worthy, uh, it is a trustworthy saying, worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So from his mother's womb until he came to know Jesus Christ, he became the chief of sinners. And yet God took that chief of sinners whom he created and knew in his father's womb, and uh, mother's womb, excuse me, and made him for his glory. Now watch what it says. But when it pleased God, verse 15, but when he who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me. He is the creator. He is the creator of all of life. And those who come to him, those who come to him must believe that he is, Hebrews eleven six. 6, that he is God. And as God, he is what? Elohim. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Have you been fighting with yourself? Have you been fighting with your mom, with your dad, with your past? Have you been weeping and moaning and groaning over the fact that it took all those years and all that mess and all that tragedy before you ever came to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you weeping over that? Stop weeping. Stop weeping. Go to the tent of meeting and let his Shekinah glory come down and let him explain to you that he is Elohim. He is your creator. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. You may not be beautiful in the eyes of the world. You may not be exquisite in the eyes of the world, but I'll tell you this, in the eyes of God, you are exactly as he designed you to be. And that design has a purpose. That design has a purpose. And that purpose is to bring God glory. And God's going to take everything about you and he's going to use it to form you into the image of his son. Two last verses. I want to take you to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we find out this, and you see the Godhead again. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. Verse 27, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You and I were created in the image of God, but sin marred that image. Sin distorted that image. Sin disfigured that image. So what is God, the creator, in the process of doing? He's in the process of taking that lump of clay that was marred and forming it again to make it into his image. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And this is what he says. In Colossians chapter 1, and this is the way he does it. In verse 27 he says, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. Now from there, I want you to go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And this is what he says in verse 28. And he can say this because he is Elohim, because he is creator. He can say this to you in verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who what? Love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose for whom he foreknew. Whom he foreknew. What did he say? I knew you before. He says, I knew you were, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Whom he foreknew, he predestined, he marked out beforehand is what it means. He marked out beforehand to become conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is what? For us. Who is against us? God is your Elohim. God's your creator. He formed you for his pleasure. He formed you for his glory. He formed you to become conformed to the image of his son. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to take everything, everything from the sperm that meant the egg through all of your past, all of the hurts, all of the wounds, and because he is the creator and because he is the redeemer, he's going to take all of those things and he's going to so work them and so mold them to make you into the image of God. The reason that that young girl could sit there beaming after all those things had been done to her, after she had had three pregnancies by her father, was because, first of all, she forgave her father. But second of all, she came to know her God. And in knowing her God, what she saw was God as creator and as sovereign, and we're going to see that later, permitted all those things to mold and to make Janet into the image of his son. And so she sits there and she nods. She's 60 pounds lighter, 60 pounds lighter. She dresses like a woman. She stopped rejecting her femininity. And you know what? She said to me, Kay, I'm going to get married. I'm going to get married, Kay. And Kay, you know what? He knows all about me. He knows all about me, Kay. We've talked and talked and talked for hours, and he said all he wants to do is love me. And you know what, Kay? I'm going to have two children. God's even giving her children in that marriage. About a year ago, there was another man that proposed to her. And she said, should I tell him about my past? And I said, Janet, honey, I think you better. Because I'm afraid if you don't, that he might not be understanding if you have some problems in your marriage bed until you adjust. And I said, but you've got to know he may reject you. But know this, if he does, God has spared you. And he's God's just showing you that he really didn't love you. She wrote me back and she said, you're right, he rejected me. He wanted somebody that nobody had ever touched. She said, it's hard, I've wept, but I'm trusting God. God knows all about you. He created you for his will and for his pleasure. That's what it means when he says that his name is Elohim. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, and you need to go home and get in your tent of meeting, and you need to thank God. 
You need to thank Him for just the way you are. And you need to know this, that whatever you are, wherever you came from, God has a beautiful purpose. And that beautiful purpose is to take all of that and use it to make you into the image of His Son. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those that are here who have deep, deep wounds and deep-seated problems, and may they come to you and say, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. May they grab hold of those promises and may they cling to them for dear life. May they know that their, their only hope, their only safety, their only rescue from the turbulent seas of life that would seek to drown them and destroy them. And may they cling to them, Father. And as they cling, may they find out, Father, that they'll hold. We commit it now to you, Father. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.